So just a heads up, we're being recorded and we can start uh, slowly starting our meeting. Um, first, I just wanted to... Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you yeah, for taking time to meet with us. Uh, one of the goals of the Board of Education for the Boulder Valley School District is to try to meet more regularly with um, city councils within our geography. As you know, we have, I think, seven different city councils um, in the Boulder Valley School District across 500,000 uh, square miles and 56 schools. So um, we're trying to do that, and we really appreciate that you kept this time with us, even though I know that we're all struggling with <clears throat> some of the challenges that are facing us with the pandemic. So I thought the um, best place to start, since there are a lot of us, is introductions. So if it's okay, I'll start with the Board um, of Education, and then we can and some of the staff members here, and then we can switch over to the Lafayette City Council and some of the staff members that you might have brought along as well. Does that sound okay with everyone? Okay, great. So uh, my name is Tina Markwood. I'm the president of the board. This is my fourth year being president, my eighth year and final year uh, serving on the Board of Education for the Boulder Valley School District. And I am gonna make a plug. We have elections coming this um, fall. So if you know people who are interested in becoming part of the Board of Education, uh, we'd love to have candidates. We're having two candidate forums coming up in March and those are posted on our website. So please just um, ask people to go there, check it out. It's a great, a great way to give back to your community and it's not always during a pandemic, and uh, which is always really challenging. Um, so that's my pitch also for to run for the board. Uh, okay, do, Kathy, you wanna go next? Sure, welcome everybody. It's great to see you. I'm Kathy Gebhardt. I'm the vice president of the board. I'm going on my fifth year on the board um, and I represent kind of District C. We, we, we represent different districts, but we really think of ourselves as representing everyone because we're voted in by the entire district. So really excited to see all of you and to share and to figure out how we can support our communities. Thank you. Yeah, and, and District C is South Boulder and I'm a Central Boulder, more or less. Okay, who wants to go next, Richard? Good evening, uh, Lafayette City Council. It's great to see you all. Uh, Richard Garcia and I represent District G, which includes Lafayette. So I'm very, very pleased to have this meeting here with you all tonight. Looking forward to it. All right, Donna? Hi, Donna Myers. Um, uh, third year, We're going into the fourth, three and a half years on the board. Um, District E, East Boulder area. And um, all right, Kitty. Hi, I'm Kitty Sargent, and I was elected the same time as Donna and the same time as Jamie, because we were both running for office for the first time the same year. So it's great to be with you all and to see you. Um, I am in District F, which is all of Broomfield and then part the southern part of Superior. And uh, did I say I'm the treasurer? Okay. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Sweeney Moran. It's a little over a year I've been on the board now. And I'm in District A, which I always struggle to explain, but it's sort of the area around the campus, kind of on either side of baseline running up and down here in Boulder. Thanks, Stacy. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Zist. I've also been on the board um, almost a year and a half, and I represent District D, which is mostly North Boulder. Okay, Rob and anyone else? Good evening, everyone. So good to see you all again. I think the last time I saw many of you was two Octobers ago before the pandemic, which seems like 50 years ago. Uh, uh, Rob Anderson and my third year superintendent here at BBSD, I um, also would introduce the Tiffany Miller, who's the executive director for the East Support Network. Uh, she, our area superintendent for the East Support Network, Robin Fernandez, is out on leave. And so Nativity will be here um, um, representing our team that, that works directly with the school. So, so good to see you all. Thanks so much for making the time this evening. All right. Um, Mayor Harkins. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Jamie Harkins, uh, this is my fourth year on the Lafayette City Council, and we are all at large. We don't have awards out here, so we all represent the entire city of Lafayette. And we have some educators on the council, which is really fun. So um, I will 
go around the room here. How about um, Mayor Pro Tem Walton? Hi, my name is Stephanie Walton. I've been serving on the council for five years. Um, I've lived in Lafayette for 15 years, and I have um, two children um, in the Boulder Valley School District. So I've been a parent in BBSD for 12 years. Thank you. Um, Councilor Bahana. Hi, I'm Chelsea Bahana, and uh, this is my fifth year on council as well. And I am a proud alum of Foothills, Casey, and Boulder High, wow. and now um, have a daughter who went to Pioneer and now Manhattan. Uh, so I love Boulder Valley Schools. I'm super excited to meet with you guys again and uh, look forward to our conversation tonight. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Mongan? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is JD Monget. I am entering my third year here on council. I too am a Boulder Valley uh, student alum, and I'm actually a full-time teacher at Angevine Middle School here in Lafayette as well. So I'm excited to have a good conversation with everyone tonight. Thank you. Councillor Wong, I saw you joined us. Yeah. Hi there, Brian Wong. I am starting my second year on council, um, and I too have a four-year-old son in the district and this is really BBSD. Um really looking to start Thank you. Your audio is breaking up a little bit, um, but we could hear you. Um Councillor Barnes. Hi everybody. My name is Tim Barnes. I'm entering my second year on uh, Lafayette City Council. Um, five-year resident of Lafayette of a son at Pioneer Elementary, and I'm an educator at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Car in South Boulder, and um, I'm happy to meet with the board today. And Councilor Briggs. Um, hello, Councilor Briggs, or Tony Briggs. Um, not Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am also alumni of uh, Boulder Valley School District. I have two girls in Boulder Valley um, schools and soon to be a third when she gets old enough. Um, and definitely excited for the meeting tonight. And then I, I believe we have our city administrator, Mr. Sprague, and then um, also Ms. Heisel on the phone. So you two could introduce yourselves as well. Certainly. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. It's great to see everybody. Uh, my name is Fritz Sprague. I'm the Lafayette City Administrator, and I've held this post for slightly over two years. And I'm Melissa Heisel. You may know me from my usual role, which is the Director of Lafayette Public Library. I am covering Deputy Administrator Dolling's maternity leave, and I'm happy to be here tonight. All right. I think we got everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank so um, we had a couple items we wanted to talk about because they tend to be on top of mind right now in most of the communities in BVSD. So the first item is is basically, you know, how are we doing school in a pandemic? Um, it's the reopening update, where we are today, uh, what are we doing, and what are our plans? So Rob's going to talk about that. Thanks, Tina. And I will quickly present and, and just go through a few slides and then Happy to answer any questions that you all may have. I think this is the right thumbs up when you can see that, so I know that that I'm presenting. Ah, wonderful, very good. Uh, so, um, as you can imagine, this past year uh, for all public educators has just been incredibly challenging. I'm really proud of the way that that the Boulder Valley School District. Um, and our community has responded to this pandemic. I think that, um, you know, amidst the challenges, we've done a lot of really, uh, really great things for our kids. Um, let's see. Uh, at the start of this pandemic, we, we made four priorities of things we wanted to accomplish, um, ensuring the health, well-being of safety and students and staff, maximizing academic growth and achievement, providing supports to our staff and teachers and assuring operational financial viability. And we've been able to do that um, through the course of the past year. Uh, we are right now um, in, we have in-person learning uh, at, to varying degrees depending on level. Um, our elementary schools are in four days a week. 
in person and our middle and high schools are in two days a week. Uh, this is part of what we designed as a five phase plan uh, prior to this school year uh, with the idea that we would have to go back and forth amongst phases throughout the year. Uh, that turned to be true. Uh, we started the year in phase one, evolved to phase three, went back to phase one, and now <laughs> we're in phase four for elementary phase three in middle uh, and, and high school. And I know that a lot of the change uh, can be frustrating for folks who um, who are trying to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, the board and I, we've committed to making sure that we work very closely with Boulder County Public Health and Broomfield Health as we make these really tough, complicated decisions, um, putting it in the hands of the experts, letting the data and science uh, drive our decisions, not politics. Um, and so that we feel like that has allowed us uh, to make sure that we're doing things in a safe manner um, while also balancing the needs of in-person learning for our kids um, um, and our families, which for those of you who have kids in our system and or have kids of your own, um, know how important that is, and, and we've been really sensitive to that. So it's just kind of a, of how we returned it, it, um, an overview of how we've returned to in-person learning in um, this semester starting in January. Um, in March, the first week of March, we're going to be providing an update to the community on what the fourth quarter will be looking like. Uh, right now, for us to, um, oops, excuse me, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself, for us to continue to increase in-person learning um, uh, from two days to, to more, uh, we're looking at community cases, especially this B1 variant, uh, uh, that, that we're really watching closely. I'm sure you all are watching closely as well. Um, and then the vaccination of our teachers. And I'll talk a little bit about vaccinations in a minute, but uh, uh, vaccinations are going incredibly well. Uh, we, we have created some neat opportunities, and so I want to thank um, any of our community members from, from the city of Lafayette who have, have joined us in helping us stay in person um, by hiring more substitutes, developing classroom monitors to help watch classes, and health monitors, we've been able to not have to close a single school since we've opened January 5th. We've learned a lot uh, from the first semester and, and with those additional resources and our community stepping up, we've been able to, once we've gone back, we haven't had to pull things back. So we know how hard and devastating that is for our kids and our families. Um, we've increased testing. Uh, we have a community site right now at Santaris High School and two um, mobile testing units that we rotate through our schools throughout the community. Um, we have 160 times, do, we've done something which we're calling saving the cohort, which is if you get testing in time, you don't have to put everybody out and quarantine them for 14 days. And so we're really um, excited about to save the, the cohort. Um, we've done over 1,200 uh, saliva tests, and these are, sites are open to community members as well. Um, students, teachers, and so we feel like it's been a really a value add for our community. So it's, again, it's another mitigation factor um, or layer that's helped us stay open. Uh, as we talk about vaccinating our teachers, we're making incredible pro progress. On Saturday, we vaccinated over a thousand teachers with the help of Boulder Community Health. Um, they've been uh, fantastic. Uh, we anticipate that we'll have all of our teachers with with both shots and 10 days. Um, to, to make sure that th that that they are fully um, inoculated by mid mid April, and uh, we have been um, prioritizing based on a set of criteria. The the, the main criteria being age, uh, but uh, folks are getting vaccinated. Teachers are getting vaccinated. Uh, we're really incredibly excited. Um, the things that we still have planning underway: uh, spring rites of, pra of passage, so uh, graduation, prom. Um, all of those events within the next few weeks, we'll be announcing how we're going to make sure that we have those. Uh, last year, we worked really hard to have in-person graduation ceremonies for all of our seniors, probably some of the most meaningful graduations I've ever been to in my life. I mean, talk about not taking something for granted. Folks were just incredibly excited to be able to participate. I was, it was great. Um, we're going to continue to, to look to, at, you know, when it's safe and when the data um, shows us it's safe to expand in-person learning. Uh, again, we're, we're looking ahead on how do we plan for the 21-22 school year. Our hope is that it's a five-day in-person experience with opportunities through Bolt Universal, which is our online school, for kids who want synchronous or asynchronous type of opportunities and aren't yet ready to come back in person. Um, and then this evening after our meeting with you all, we'll be presenting to the board 
on how are we going to create the right amount of social, emotional, and academic supports for our kids to support them as we come out of this pandemic, make sure um, kids are where they need to be um, supported, again, socially, emotionally, and uh, where we are academically. So uh, that's the, the, the brief, quick update in regards to reintroduction. I will stop presenting uh, to see if there are any questions, comments, or concerns uh, that we can answer for the group. Okay, and, and Rob, just a clarification that the Centaurus testing site is open to the community at large, but the mobile testing sites are only open to students and faculty member, not parents, because I tried. Yeah. Yes, no, I'm sorry, yes. The mobile units are, are units that we deploy within um, to our schools based on if we're seeing spikes in cases or if, if there's students that we need to, say, to test to save the cohort. Uh, but uh, right there on South Boulder at Centaurus High, um, you see the trailers. I pass it, um, you know, almost every day uh, with the big signs on COVID Check Colorado. Those those uh, community members are able to test at those sites. Okay, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have um, two topics I was wondering if you could just touch on um, what your plans are for state testing or any advocacy around that, um, decisions around the state level. Um, as you may know, we're considering a resolution um, tonight at our council meeting after this meeting. And um, secondly, wondered about um, mental health supports. If you feel like you have a, um, adequate resources, if you need more, uh, where the gaps might be um, for students and families and staff, uh, faculty and staff. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the first one. Um, the Board of Education last Tuesday passed a resolu resolution asking to pause testing for this spring. And um, the reason is, is that we have a lot of local formative assessments and our teachers have a really good idea of where we are and where the gaps are. So this year, and, and we also have 30% of our learners are remote so that the data set we would have is probably not reflective. We also have a pretty high percentage of remote learners that are um, learning English language and are uh, living in poverty. So the data we'd get out of this in this case will not be useful to us um, as a measurement or even as a comparative to other schools. And I mean, you could argue there's always issues with some of the comparisons being made um, across schools, but that was the rationale for the resolution that we unanimously passed last Tuesday. Um, and also the resolution is on board docs, the final language that talks about why we passed it. Does that help? Okay. And um, I'm happy to answer the, qu the second question. I, I do think that, you know, as students return and as we're trying to support students, um, we've had to expand some of our mental health supports. Uh, we have been opening, we heard, we've been hearing a lot from our high school parents with high school kids absolutely struggling in this pandemic. And so um, while we're open two days a week, we've opened our high schools on Mondays for those types of supports. Kids can come in, get any counseling support, set appointments, anything they want to do. Um, as, we, as we move forward to next year um, in our budgeting process, I think that, that it won't be a surprise to the board that you know, we expect to to, to dedicate some resources to the continued support of the mental health of our kids. That's incredibly important. Um, and I think that it just as a community, this is an issue that we're gonna have to lock arms on and, and really understand that um, as we come out of this pandemic, you know, a lot of our kids have been struggling. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen an uptick in, in drug overdoses, uh, very scary. I'm sure you've all have seen that we pushed out some information last week on the fentanyl spiked um, oxycodone and, um, Xanax, that, that those pills that are making their waves around in our community. Uh, we, we do think that and, and are, are really um, understanding that we need to do um, as much as we can. Um, and and I, again, I think that, you know, when we talk about supporting mental health, it's, it's a community and school, um, schools working together to try to do that. And so uh, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if Nativity, if you wanted to you know, um, add anything to that based on your experience as the executive director in the East Learning community. Yeah, similar, the high schools, um, we, most of the supports are being done with individual outreach or on those Mondays. The same is happening for elementary and middle. Um, typically with my elementary schools, principals are tracking students that either are having engagement issues or 
or mental health concerns. And then we're outreaching to our student support services um, in the East network that will help support uh, help support families either um, you know, individually or with home visits or whatever whatever they're needing, um, we're reaching out to our student support services. So all of our principals have a tracking system to address the, those needs, and then we'll coordinate with our with the student support services to reach out. Okay, um, and I'll add one other thing on our our board received a presentation from Boulder Boulder County Health, and they did disaggregate some of the mental health behavior of teens. For the last year so if you haven't had that presentation it's available um, and it was also on our board meeting um, it's uh, we tape everything so it's there for you if you want to look at it I saw Brian Wong's hand go up thank you can you hear me okay yes perfect I just had a question in regards to the, um, the testing so if we move away from testing and it's just a curiosity Will that impact any state or federal funding um, potentially, or that really won't have an impact on that? In this case, we'd be looking for the state and the federal government to waive the testing. And so that's part of the idea for the resolution. It's a great question, is so that we're not penalized for not testing. Great. And then one question about around internet access. How has that been for the students within the district and maybe the Lafayette being able to do remote learning? Has that been a challenge due to connectivity or due to socioeconomic issues? Just wanted to get some perspective on that. Rob? Yeah, I'm happy to take that question. That's a, a, a great uh, question, Councilor Wong. We have been working um, with our community to, um, with our families and within the community to, to ensure that we're making sure that all kids are connected. Uh, we have a unique partnership in, here in BBSD with a, a company called LiveWire, um, where we actually have been able to put antennas, um, and over the course of the next several years, we'll do this for all of our schools, um, have to, to connect antennas on the top of our, of our schools to then allow us to connect for free uh, students who qualify for free and reduced lunch to the internet um, through through this unique kind of Wi-Fi network that we're able to stand up. Um, we've also been procuring hotspots and and making sure that that we connect with our families. Our family equity and partnership coordinators um, have been reaching out um, not to schools to find families in need to make sure that we've been connecting them appropriately. And so I think a lot of community effort has gone into this. I think that we've worked with. Our, our, our foundation impact on education to provide funding for some of these resources. And so most of our kids, if not all of our kids, do, are connected. We feel really good about that. Um, that being said, I do think it's an issue. I mean, I, I think that the, the access to the internet is a utility, should be treated like a utility and everybody should have it. And um, I think that, that we have some work to do there um, as a community at large. Uh, but in BBSD, we, we feel like we've, we've met that challenge head on and it have been pretty successful. Thank you. Okay, um, Chelsea, I see your hand up. Sure, thank you, Tina. Um, I had a couple of questions. Following up on that last one that you were answering um, kind of goes together. Um, as you um, sort of um, pass SROs out of your system, and then um, how, how are you gonna look at funding, number one, for how will you use that funding perhaps to support maybe the mental health of students in another manner? And then um, you mentioned the family equity and partnership coordinators. I wonder what will be lost um, with the advent of SROs leaving your schools so that, um, that, like, that will keep us connected as far as a community. I'm thinking of the fact that I work in a school also and our SRO does a lot to connect city resources with the school. And I'm wondering how um, you guys might be able to bridge that with them leaving? That's my one question and I have two more, but go for it. <laughs> okay, and I'll just um, jump in. We um, didn't actually pay for our SROs in general, okay. just so that we don't quite get the budget. A lot of people have talked about transferring the money there, so there wasn't really any money there. Um, but other than that, I'll let Rob go in and jump in and address that. So those are great questions. I, we are presenting to our board on March 9th on how we're going to continue to proceed. 
um, to make sure that that uh, that um, that we're providing kids and schools the level of support that they need um, that will replace some of the things that you shared that that fell um, within the duties of school resource officers. And so, you know, how do we make sure that we're connecting, um, staying connected with the city, city of Lafayette, and, and with your chief? Um, how are we? making sure that we're providing the kids the, the supports that they need and, and uh, providing a safe environment for all kids. And so uh, more to come on that. We'll have a, a meeting March 9th where we're going to kind of really lay out that plan for the board. Uh, but our team has been working very closely um, with, with your police chief and the, and the, and the, 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 the chiefs in the, in the surrounding municipalities to begin to start to unpack how, how do we do this? What are the levels of support that we need? Uh, those levels of support would come forward to our board within um, this year's budgeting uh, cycle. That's great to hear. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we did it completely in other school districts, you know, it's a partnership sort of thing. So thanks for that clarification. Um, and then you were, I have two questions. One, you were talking about mental health staff. You were addressing Mayor Pro Tem Walton about mental health supports for students. I was wondering about mental health supports for staff, um, teachers and specificity and, um, what you guys are doing for outreach there. And then my other one, just to get it out of the way, is um, we the last time we met with you, three years ago now, I didn't realize it was quite that long ago, but, um, or two maybe you said, is about around um, special populations uh, and discipline. We were asking about um, the ethnic and racial makeup of disciplinary issues, um, special education flags or anything like that. And um, you were looking to sort of clean up that data. And I'm just wondering what kind of progress has been made in that area. Great questions, great memory. Uh, yeah, it, two years ago, gosh, like again, it seems like it was yesterday. Um, so yeah, so we've been reaching out with staff. We've been offering actually um, several sessions around mindfulness for our staff as kind of a first you know, how do you manage stress and what, what are, what's the neuroscience around stress? And, and, you know, it's actually fascinating that it's certainly, um, you know, stressed out teachers don't make good teachers. We need to do everything that we can to, to, to try to, um, to, to help them. Um, um, and we teaching and breathing techniques. Um, we've brought in a, a group called Pure Edge who's, who's been partnering with us. Um, they're a nonprofit and it's been totally free, which has been wonderful. Um, we have uh, certainly our in employee assistance, uh, program through our insurance um, agency that we make sure that, that that our employees know about, and then we're just, you know, just instructed our leaders to reach out and care for the people you work with and work for you and work with you, and uh, make sure that you're connecting them to the resources that we have. And so we've uh, done uh, we do things. Uh, we have a, a like a talk show we call the weekly wake up that we do 7:30 on every Monday, and so we've done some of these mindfulness sessions and talked about the mental health of employees in those in those sessions um, and then just continue to try to do everything we can to let folks know that we're here for them. So um, around mental health. Um, in regards to discipline, uh, so we've done a lot um, since we've last talked. Uh, we went through and totally revamped our discipline policy, our bullying policy, our discipline matrix. Um, we are working forward um, we'll be presenting to the, the board in April around some of the strategic plan metrics on how um, we'll measure the, measure the disproportionality of discipline for um, students, whether they're on IEPs or students of color. Uh, we, have, we have embedded that as a goal within our district's unified improvement plan, um, and we'll be pushing that to schools um, as well as a focus. Um, I, I would say that the, the progress we've made at this point, we've gotten the systems much better. Uh, as a reminder, every school was kind of coding discipline in their own ways. Every school was was determining what consequences for what infractions. There wasn't a unified system. So I think at a systems level between the policy, the matrix, um, we're in much better shape. We've done some training and we have a, a monthly meeting with individuals from every one of our schools to review the discipline data that's actually coming in during the pandemic. Um, kids, you know, now, now that we're starting to get back in person, um, we are having some 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 consequences and in, in discipline issues in schools, um, and we're and we're we're constantly looking at that to understand how can we implement um, restorative practices or other more positive um, behavior interventions as opposed to always consequences and always taking away. And so I would say that that those efforts um, are ongoing, 
and um, will continue to be a priority for us. So I appreciate you bringing that up, and thank you for remembering that. Okay. Um, JD, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I just, just first of all, just a quick procedural question. Is there more to the presentation, or is this kind yeah. of in Q and A? There was actually a part at the end for questions from the council, but um, I think it's okay to get your pressing questions out of the way now. We probably won't get through the whole agenda, so I was going to ask President Marquis if you wanted to like triage the rest of it and make sure you hit anything that was very important. But I think it's fine to ask your question now, and then we can get back to the agenda. Yeah, this is the most important thing, anyways, right? This is what we <laughs> want to know. Um, so I just had some quick questions regarding Mondays. Um, I know that um, you know students are only in-person learning Tuesday through Friday through a current hybrid model. On Mondays is usually where we have our staff meetings and dedicated teaching plan time. I'm curious um, to see, you know, as other districts are considering opening up five days a week, and I know you know our district has talked about that a little bit. So what is our plan uh, for Mondays for the rest of this school year? Are we considering, uh, you know, going back five days a week or what are our thoughts around that? That's a great question. Um, so we, we're looking at supports we can provide for students on Mondays, but we also want to preserve that day for planning time for our teachers, especially our middle school teachers right, who have such little planning time during the week. We know those Mondays have been critical for their success. Um, elementary and high school as well. You know, our, our, you know, at our board meeting last Tuesday, uh, when asked the question, I shared that, you know, we, those Mondays are really critical for our teachers to make sure that, that we're, they're delivering both in-person and online instruction simultaneously. And I think what's important for everybody to understand is even if we said, okay, everybody come back, um, to, you know, for President Marquis, you know, her comment that we have um, a third, at least 30% of our high school kids that are fully online and 25% of our middle um, and elementary school kids that are fully online. And they're at a place where they're not comfortable to come back. We've given them that option and opportunity. And so teachers need to plan, you know, one out of every four kids in elementary and middle school is fully online. So, you, so it takes just another depth of planning that our schedule and planning time and the, and the agreements we have, um, they, they, don't, they don't provide enough of that time. So, uh, but what we are looking at is how can we bring in resources and supports um, for kids um, in elementary and middle school. So kids who needed to come in that extra day, um, we're able to do that. We'll hear more about that tonight, um, board members, as we talk about our COVID catch up plan. Um, and so we're trying to get the best of both worlds. Uh, but, but we, at this point, if we were to go five days a week, um, we would still have this high flex teaching, which is this online and in-person teaching at the same time, and don't feel like it would be manageable for our employees um, or fair to them to pull that away. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's, that's good news. Um, so uh, although you know teachers and, and staff are working Mondays, students are not in person. And so I was curious, um, do we provide as a district of food and other resources for students on Mondays? like other districts are? Uh, so, so we provide food distribution, um, um, and the way that we've done that is really almost the distribution of groceries. Now, some school districts, what they'll do is they'll make kids come in for a meal and pick up a meal at a time. Um, we feel like that it's a better use of those, those resources to have several times throughout the week um, at several sites to, to distribute um, groceries and food. Um, and so we, we've got alternating times. I, I know that our times have, have continued to switch um, as we've moved through the pandemic. Um, I believe we've switched it to evenings and we have a couple of evenings a week that we're doing that. Uh, but when we, we distribute those groceries, it's enough food for, to, for families to make um, several meals um, as opposed to the other strategy I've seen other districts use where it's a grab and go breakfast, but every breakfast or every lunch You've got to show up in the school and grab it and bring it home. And so we felt like it was, it was just more efficient and a better use to kind of package all of our groceries and distributors in, in that manner. Yeah, that makes sense. And sorry, when and where do you do this? So so it's changed a few times. I, I'd have to follow up with you on the specifics. Um, at one point, we had seven sites throughout the district. Nativity, do you know, do, are we still distributing? It's always the Sanchez out here in Lafayette. Yep, we've been at Sanchez, Louisville, uh, Middle, 
Um, I don't know, Nativity, do you, do you yeah. recall? It's not I can get to you this information. It's just it's changed a, a few yeah, times. Yeah, it's changed a couple of times. I know Sanchez has been consistent um, and over by Pioneer, um, but I'm not, I don't know what the, what has changed middle and high level. And can I add one thing too is um, I have kids in the district. I actually get a text every time there's food distribution. So I personally know exactly where it is, which day it is. And I've gone to a site just to check it out and was really impressed with the quality of the food and the quantity. And they're extremely generous. Um, so I, I, I turned down half of it. I, I can't use four gallons of milk and it was great. It was really great. So they're meeting needs, not maybe just of those students, but maybe some other people that have needs in that home as well. And I just included information on the chat that gives you the link that gives all of the details. Cool. I, yeah, sorry, I don't want to keep it going, but just I, I just had a, I wanted to, one more question on this. Do you have to qualify to receive the, the food or is, is it available to everybody? Show up and you get it. Uh, and, and it is at Sanchez, um, Crestview, Columbine, Emerald, Louisville, um, Netherlands, and Manhattan. And that's and during the day from 10.30 to 1.30. And then from 4 to 6 p.m., we have distribution also at our admin center. So whether you work during the day or you work in the evenings, there's different opportunities for you to pick it up. And it's um, we distribute at least 10 meals worth of food items and fresh produce um, in each one of those bags. Yeah, the reason, the reason why I ask is, well, two reasons. One is, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure our resources aren't finite to the point where if we are offering it to everyone, that's great. However, we want to make sure that the families in need that need the need the food and lunch the most can have access to them. And, and so if everyone ha has availability to it and all of it gets taken early, you know, I want to make sure that there is some way to, to, to ensure that there's equity in that program as well. And I know there is. So. Um, and then another reason why I bring it up is because I recall like uh, about two years ago here in Lafayette, we as a city entered into a partnership with, with the district to provide lunches for students during the summertime as well. Um, and that was a cool program here at, at Lamontos Park, you know, just down the street. Yep. I mean, uh, and we were able to distribute those, you know, uh, you know, throughout the summer. And so I just, that is a program that I really hope to see uh, continued on in, in, in the future, as well as, you know, um, any other time, you know, we can collaborate a city and a school district, you know, I definitely want to see those partnerships um, flourish. And so whether that's during the summer, whether that's during winter break, uh, whether that's during Mondays, days off, things like that, I just want to make sure our students here in, in, in Lafayette have uh, food and resources and all the other resources they need on days off of school as well. Thank you. Great. So I, and, and to your point, we should probably stick to the agenda, although I feel like there's so many pressing questions about reopening, I you know, kind of went for it. Um, do we want to, do you want to give a brief up overview of the strategic plan, Rob? Uh, I, very brief. So um, council members, as you'll recall, I started to go through this two Octobers ago um, and, and talk to you a little bit about it. So um, let me present really quick. I'll just give you a couple places to find out more information to kind of kind of keep track of our progress. I'm very proud. Um, I think our plan is um, going very well and would love to commend you all on your recent retreat where you all set some strategic priorities for the city of Lafayette. I, I reviewed some of those documents. It looked like it was really time well spent and you all have a clear direction of where you want the city to go. So, so kudos to you all anytime that government entities invest that time in trying to figure out where you want to go. I just think it's a wonderful thing. So congrats to you. Um, but as a reminder um, to everyone, we have three big outcomes that we're trying to get in our All Together for All Students strategic plan. And that's to all make sure that all students benefit from challenging and re relevant educational opportunities, that we want to reduce these disparities in achievement, and that when kids graduate from BVSD, we want to make sure that they graduate with not just a, a diploma, but with the skills that they need to be successful in whatever their future may hold. Um, and so based on that, we um, uh, I'll just skip through some of these slides. Uh, you may remember this busy slide. This is a collection of the 13 strategic initiatives that we have moving forward. They're going to hopefully lead us to that place. 
Uh, many of that work is starting now. Um, we've been working, we're actually in a meeting earlier today with our district leaders and teacher leaders around some of the work that we're going to be doing next year to improve our instructional infrastructure, which would be the resources and support and expectations for teachers um, to help make their jobs easier and help them to be more clear on where they need to go. Uh, we've always had amazing people in this district and we feel like with the right supports, resources, um, and coaching that we are going to be able to reach all of our goals that, that we've set forth. Um, if you're interested in any of our equity work that, that you can be found throughout these initiatives, I'd encourage you to go to bbsd.org backslash excellence through equity. Um, and it would highlight much of the equity work that we're doing as a district. Again, um, uh, I think some of you have seen some of this, but really, really exciting um, things are happening uh, moving forward in regards to equity. Um, and so uh, in, in regards to that, that's like a, a, a two minute uh, whip through quick strategic plan update. Um, I'm happy to, to dig in at all, or if you'd like, Tina, I can continue to move on the agenda. It looks like we've got about 18 minutes left um, and would want to get through the enrollment uh, piece and yeah. then also just um, let, you know, just talk a little bit about our network support um, structure too. Yeah, let's just keep going forward. Very good. Um, so as I shared earlier, um, about two years ago, we broke our district down into three support networks. Um, to try to make sure that we're driving resources closer to our schools and community. Um, Nativity Miller is with us here to, this evening from the East Network. Um, these are the schools that, that our East Network supports. And so the schools that would be in Lafayette, um, Sataris, um, Angevine, uh, Lafayette Pioneer, and Sanchez, Peak uh, to Peak, and Justice High School. Um, I believe those are there's one more. There's one more. Ryan, Ryan come on. To, uh, I miss Ryan. Good. It's probably the most, one of the biggest schools in Lafayette. So, uh, so um, Nativity, do you want to talk a minute about kind of the support structure and and um, and how you what you know how you and and the team that we have supports the schools? Absolutely. So my role as the executive director is to work directly with the principals. So I spend about 50% of my week in schools um, with principals and in a normal setting in classrooms um, and working with them to identify their problems of practice, as well as coaching them um, with the leadership, their leadership skills, um, and especially with the rollout of the strategic plan. Um, the other piece that we do is we leverage the network system. And so um, each network has um, a reading coordinator, a STEM coordinator, an MTSS person. And so as um, schools identify their need and their problem of practice, part of my job is to, is to leverage the network support staff so that we are responding to schools and we're not creating stuff at the district and then telling our schools what they need to do. Um, so that has been one of the um, greatest things I think that's happened since we've moved to the network system. Um, it also took down the number of schools that each ex that the executive directors had. Uh, so when I started in Boulder Valley with Rob, um, I had all elementaries, which was really challenging to not only see them, you know, on a monthly basis, but to also really get to know the staff, um, the, the students and their data needs. So with this new system, each, each executive director has a smaller number of schools. I have the, the least amount of schools due to um, the population and demographics in which we serve. Um, but again, my main focus is working with principals, um, coaching, um, evaluating, and um, you know, identifying, again, their problem of practice. Um, the, the network support staff all report to um, Robin Fernandez, who is our area superintendent for the East. And her job really is to, to work with the network support staff in, their, in the projects that they're working on and to respond to the schools. So we've had a lot of positive, um, there was a lot of apprehension when we, when we changed to the system, but um, overall it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Nativity. And I will keep going unless there's any pressing questions. Go ahead. All righty. Um, well, at this point on the agenda, um, 
uh, is the focus of the 2021 legislative platform. I don't have any slides to support that, Tina, so I'm going to turn it over to you so you could share um, share with uh, Council uh, some of the priorities of BBSD. Sure, and this is just really brief. Um, as we mentioned, we passed a resolution in support of waiving testing for the reasons I described. Um, we'll also be looking to advocate for funding to buffer some of the enrollment shifts that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, because we did see declines in enrollment, but because we don't have an idea who's going to show up yet in the fall, we'd like to be able to maintain the staff and support um, for everyone who comes back, as well as maintain or increase funding to help do catch-up work, and also in general, can you know increase mental health supports, um, some of the other initiatives that the board has prioritized for many years. Um, and then the other piece is we did enter or we did pass a resolution in support of putting limits on THC uh, in marijuana products. There are some new products out that <clears throat> we feel weren't really contemplated when marijuana was legalized. Um, and they're <clears throat> called, you know, wax and dabbing and shatter. Uh, we're seeing some pretty negative outcomes with our students at the high school level and it's very accessible. So that is something we also um, are supporting at a statewide level. So that's pretty much all we've done so far. Um, and that's a, that's a summary. So I think we can move on to the next item. Very good. We'll just talk a little bit about enrollment trends in Lafayette. And I think that that's all that we have in regards to slides. Um, I'll stop presenting and then we can use our last 10 minutes for conversation. Um, as you can see, the, the, in Lafayette and Erie, our K-12 enrollment trends um, since 2013 um, have been, uh, have been in, in, in a place of growth. Uh, this past school year, as you can see, was, was a bit of an anomaly. I think every district in the Denver metro, um, their enrollment went down. So we don't know that that is, is necessarily a trend, um, as the asterisks would show that this is um, not reflective of typical growth that we feel like we would see. Uh, and this was, uh, in high school, we saw less of maybe a drop, um, again, uh, that, you know, increasing enrollment. And then middle school, um, a little bit of a drop. Uh, but again, you, know, you can see um, a, a growth incline in regards to our enrollment in Lafayette and Erie um, uh, um, at middle school. Um, at elementary, in comparison to high school, uh, you know, it's more of a flatter kind of a, um, of a, of a trend, um, which, which we'd anticipate would start coming down. Um, and that's an overall trend within our district where our elementary schools are getting smaller um, and our middle and high school students, um, those numbers are, are, are more staying true uh, to the trend lines that we have typically seen. And I, I can make sure that you all have this presentation. I know, um, I know that, that our team speaks with, uh, with our, our city administrators and Fritz. The, uh, I know that, that our team has been in touch with your team um, as we think about growth. Um, and we, we're always in touch with our municipalities as we, as we think about um, you know, how our schools are doing, making sure that, that we're dealing with overcrowding. Um, and, uh, and so we'll continue to stay in touch with your staff on these, on these topics. And I'll add one thing. I, there's one slide that isn't included, but it did break out Lafayette from Erie. Um, and it does, it does show that Lafayette has, its growth has slown. It was a, a growth, an area of higher growth historically, but now um, this area is being compensated by growth in Erie. So Rob, if we could also send them, I think Glenn would know what I'm talking about. That actually shows the city of Lafayette broken out. And I believe they have it by uh, elementary, middle, and high school enrollment. We can certainly do that. All righty. So with 11 minutes left, I'll stop presenting and um, turn it over uh, to you, Tina, to, or to board or to council to um, pose or ask any questions you may have and have a 10-minute have a conversation. Yeah. Richard. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Thanks, Rob. Uh, for the Lafayette City Council members, uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One is I have been a Chicano activist in Boulder County for over 40 years and uh, longer than I have been on the board, obviously. And uh, my primary uh, concern around uh, the uh, Lafayette community and the Boulder community has been the Latino community. 
And uh, one of the things that uh, I do because of my activism over the years is that I do have a lot of connections with the uh, uh, community organizations such as uh, Engage Latino Parents Advancing Student Outcomes, uh, Sister Carmen, uh, and uh, others. Uh, but we do hear a lot of uh, uh, concerns from the Latino community as it relates to the schools and stuff like that. And, and some of that I know kind of rolls over to some of the policy making decisions that we're making, that we're doing now. For example, the discipline policy, uh, uh, bullying, we, you know, we've never had a bullying policy before we have one now. Uh, and a uh, couple of things that the Latino community has brought forth uh, and, uh, and, and to the administration, and that is nutrition. Uh, a lot of things around nutrition, uh, uh, how, how uh, uh, the uh, food services staff treats Latino kids and all of that, that's been corrected. Uh, and the other thing too that uh, uh, the Latino community, especially in Lafayette, has been looking at is uh, how well are they received in the schools, uh, especially with the front office staff and personnel, uh, how do they treat them, et cetera. And, uh, I know that's that's also being discussed uh, at the district level, uh, and translation has been a big one. Uh, so you know the work that the Lafayette parents have provided, or the input the Lafayette parents have provided, has really um, supported and provided a lot of uh, information to the administration uh, as it relates to certain decisions that are being made. So I just want you to know that that because of my activism, um, I hear a lot from the Latino community, probably more so than anybody else. Uh, and uh, uh, I do relay that information to the administration and to our board. Thank you. Um, other questions? Not seeing any hands going up. All right. Has her hand up. There we go. Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I was curious, um, something that we just are getting kicked off. Um, well, a couple of things. We have lots of plans going on <laughs> in Lafayette. Um, we are hoping in the next um, six to nine months to complete our comprehensive plan. And um, some of these things have gotten a little stalled in the last year because of the community engagement that we value and want to incorporate. But um, one thing that I think um, I wanted to ask your um, initial thoughts, um, we just um, have completed an RFP and signed a contract um, with a consultant who's going to be doing a multimodal transportation plan. Um, I know that with middle school and high school enrollments and baseline, <laughs> there's there's a lot of activity. We're making improvements upstream um, near um, the intersection of um, Highway 7 and 119th to drive more traffic to the four lanes of baseline. And so I'm just wondering, um, with knowing that some of those impacts are coming that are immediate, and then knowing the 18 month um, transportation plan that we're kicking off, I'm wondering um, how it would be helpful to involve um, BBSD in this conversation so as we um, uh, get, get started. I'm sure you never hear anything about transportation, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I would guess that our um, transportation department probably is involved, or they know each other. They tend to be so well connected. Um, but Rob, is there a way that you can um, help make sure that they are connected in this conversation? Yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll connect with Fritz after the meeting and make sure that um, that 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 he has all the contact for our team, uh, both. Uh, uh, Director of Transportation and then Rob Price, our Assistant Soup of Operations, to make sure that uh, we provide you all the information that you might need uh, for your study and that you know we can see if there's any synergies there, if there's any ways we could work together to to try to solve the same problem. Yeah, that's Appreciate that, Rob. Thank you. I think that'll be great. I mean, anytime that we can look to um, for the multimodal aspects of some of that too, um, obviously that could be um, 
a big push. We've done improvements in the last couple of years with some safe routes to school, and I'm sure that there is more work that can be done there too. So I think it'll be important um, not only to have your involvement because you have certainly um, a, an impact at some peak times around town, but um, but also just to help perhaps get the word out to the community when we are seeking some of the community engagement and some of those um, parts and pieces. Um, I also wanted to just stress to the board too, if you haven't had a chance to um, come visit us in Lafayette, please do. Um, uh, we, we definitely um, enjoy a unique, um, small town vibe here. And so we've talked a lot about in our comp comprehensive plan about growth, the impacts that growth, not just in Lafayette, but even in a, the bigger impact that the growth of surrounding communities has on Lafayette. And um, we feel that everybody is driving through Lafayette on their way to Boulder. So the transportation is a big piece, um, but just also the the flow and the quality of life for people and the impacts that that has and how we maintain that small town vibe. And so I think that there is sort of a, an interesting connection with the open enrollment opportunity for families, uh, for Lafayette families, and how we can continue to um, honor that opportunity for families within a school district, but also create opportunities for placemaking and community building in our neighborhoods. Um, for example, when I first lived, uh, moved to Lafayette, I lived in a three block, um, in, uh, on a street with three blocks, there were about 30 kids and um, I think every school in the district was represented in that three blocks. And so um, so I just um, point that out to you to, um, to let you know that if you haven't had an opportunity to experience that special um, eclectic vibe and small town feel that we um, value here in Lafayette, please come visit. Um, but also know that um, decisions you make um, at times as, as a school board does, um, does impact that. For example, um, there, um, the, um, there are several schools, I don't know what the numbers are, um, but maybe about a third of the kids, I'm, uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but there are several uh, Lafayette students that go to Douglas Elementary, um, the way that that, that um, neighborhood school is district. And so that's just an opportunity where it starts to pull people from Lafayette toward Boulder and um, and so, you know, when, when the new school in Erie opened, um, just making sure that if there are opportunities to keep, um, keep some Lafayette-centric thinking um, in, for the schools and for the residents of Lafayette, where are those, where are those opportunities um, that helps um, continue to, to um, underscore what, what we find attracts people to Lafayette and what we continue to value and, and what we hope to hold on to in this community. That's um, some of the feedback that we've um, found out during our comprehensive plan. So thank you for allowing me a, a moment to share that perspective. Thank you. And let's try to get one last question from JD and then maybe we'll wrap up. Perfect, because I don't have a question. It's just a comment. I wanted to squeeze it in before you ran out of the time. I really just wanted to say as a teacher in Boulder Valley, I really do appreciate uh, the efficiency of getting those vaccines distributed to all of us. Um, it, I got mine on Saturday, um, and so I really, I do really appreciate the hard work that put into organizing all that. It is means a lot. I'm so happy to see everyone getting vaccinated, vaccinated so quickly. So thank you so much for to to our uh, superintendent, to our board, and to everyone a part of the district that that's uh, played a role in that. Thanks. Yes, and thank you for getting a vaccine. <laughs> Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much. And of course, anyone can reach out to us. All of our email addresses are on our, are on our website if you have follow-up questions with any of us individually as well. But thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having us. Um, enjoy the rest of your meeting. And to the Lafayette folks, I'll see you over on Zoom. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Good seeing you. Take care. Good to see you all.